Let's do it. All right, guys. Welcome back to episode two of uh, Five Features Podcast. We got the uh, St. Joe's legend and one of my boys here, Ryan Daly. Uh, Ryan, what's up, man? It's good to have you. What's up, Joe Pa? Happy to be on. Really uh, excited to get on this. You know, obviously, you've since I've known you, you've always been a fan of college basketball, especially Philadelphia area basketball. To see to see you start this, you know, it's it's great to see, and you know, I'm happy to you know play a part in it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I had to change my background because I was getting chirps from people that I was a little messy. I had some uh, open drawers and some some sheets in the background of the last podcast with Jensen. My mom was sending me some chirps, so I had to switch it up a little bit. But yeah, whatever the mom wants, you got to kind of you know obey that. I know that rule <laughs> exactly. So let's uh let's start sort of you know with you know, your childhood because obviously you know you're so tied into this 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 uh, you know this tradition you've been around it pretty much your whole life so I I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with like your sort of family history and background but if you want to sort of explain the hierarchy of your family and like all the sort of connections that you have you know there might be there's a lot yeah there's a lot there's uh, I almost forget some of them but yeah so you know I grew up in St Dennis so obviously it's Probably 10 to 15 minutes away from St. Joe's. Um, Havertown's very close to, you know, Overbrook and, you know, that side of Philadelphia. Um, always been a basketball family. You know, my dad played at St. Joe's. Um, my dad actually played for my mom's dad at St. Joe's. So my my dad was married his coach's daughter, which is a wild move looking back. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's a little bit wild. Uh, my uncle, my mom's brother, was a hawk at St. Joe's. He was um, the hawk? He was the Hawk. Yeah, senior oh, was the Hawk. Uh, my cousin went to St. Joe's. He was a manager. My grandfather, my biological grandfather, Jim Boyle, was the head coach of the Hawks for, I want to say, like eight or nine years in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so, you know, I have the, that connection. Um, you know, my other Jim Lynham, who is not my biological grandfather, but he plays that role for me. He, uh, he obviously is a Hawk legend. His numbers retired. He, uh, he was the head coach of St. Joe's when, you know, they beat the Paul before he moved to the NBA. Um, yeah. My brother walked on a temple uh, for his last two years of college. Uh, my aunt is the academic coordinator for LaSalle's men's basketball team. I almost went to the university of Penn coming out of high school. I was recruited by them. Uh, my dad actually played for Steve Donahue in high school. So um in terms of big five and Philly basketball connections, you know, I was blessed to be in that environment from a young age. And, uh, you know, for that, I'm really grateful because, you know, it kind of shaped the way my life has gone. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you talked about your dad playing at St. Joe's. How much did that mean for him, you know, for you to come there and, and play for that school that he played for and, you know, have the success you had there? Yeah, I think for my whole family, um, it was it was special. Uh, unfortunately, my nan passed away right when I started playing uh, my junior year, but she was like the mother of St. Joe's. You know, they lived at the they, it was called the executive house. It's now the point. Uh, my mom grew up on campus. You know, my dad went there. My dad grew up in Lansdowne, which is right by Bonner. So five minutes away. You know, we've always been St. Joe's people, um, you know, through whenever, you know, they went to the Sweet 16, I think in 96. I wasn't alive then, you know. Obviously, the Jameer years, you know, that's all, you know, my birthday parties go to St. Joe's games um, because of my parents. You know, they they love the school and what it stands for and the basketball program. And, uh, you know, it meant a lot to them when I, you know, decided to transfer. You know, I think they had a feeling that I was looking for something like St. Joe's from a school perspective. Um, and, you know, it worked out great. Yeah. You know, I think probably a lot of times the first probably exposure people got of you as far as, you know, some big five basketball fans is probably at Carroll. Uh, high school, you know, there's, you know, obviously you ended up winning the MVP um, of the of the high school of the Catholic League, which is, you know, a tremendous feat. And you know, there's some dogs in that league, especially when you were there. So uh, what can you say about sort of the competition of that league and how that sort of helped you to the next level? Yeah, so it's funny. So, you know, I, I moved um, when I was in seventh grade. So I moved away for seventh, eighth and ninth grade. I went to I went to Boston for my dad's job at BU. He was an assistant at BU. And then I moved to Penn State when um he was there so for eighth and ninth grades I was in state college you know my ninth grade year I played freshman team I wasn't allowed to pull, even try out for JV because they didn't think I, it was even worth it but on my freshman team my little brother played on my freshman team as an eighth grader there was another eighth grader on my team and there was a seventh grader who ended up going to Princeton to play but I wasn't you know good enough to try out for JV um you know what's your Jordan what's your Michael Jordan uh didn't make his high school team story exactly yeah I'm, ba <laughs> I'm basically like the Michael Jordan of uh state college uh, ninth grade sports no uh 
So, you know, when I transferred to Carroll my sophomore year, you know, I, I grew up on the Catholic League. My dad was a coach at Bonner. You know, I grew up going to Carroll games. I grew up watching Roman. You know, my dad was pretty successful at Bonner. So I was always attracted to the Palestra, you know, the Catholic League and what it meant. So, you know, when it time to, you know, my dad, honestly, is the reason I went to Carroll. He thought I had a chance. He thought if I hit six foot four, I, I had a small chance to go Division One. And my parents were, um, you know, the best people in the world for – splitting up basically you know my dad stayed in penn state for work and you know my mom me my brother my sister moved back to live in my grandmom's house um just to see if i could go division one that was, and there, believe me there was not even a thought in my brain that i would have been the mvp of the catholic league three years later um but yeah you know the catholic league is special because it's just the city itself obviously is a basketball town um you have six colleges in a 12 mile radius but then the high school basketball, where, where you play a semifinal game and it's 8,000 people at one of the most historic venues in college basketball, you know, you really don't have a choice but to be prepared when you go to college basketball because you've seen big games. You've seen Division One kids from the time you were a freshman or a sophomore. You know, my sophomore year team when I transferred, you know, I was ninth man. I played JV for the most part. Um, we had, I think, seven or eight guys that ended up going to Division One, and I think six of us had 1,000 points, and the other one was Derek Jones, who went <laughs> – was a one and done. Jones. You know, Josh Sharkey, Dave Beatty, um, Austin Tillman, myself, Nasir Brooks, you know, they three or four year starters in college. You know, there's something about Philadelphia basketball and the Catholic League specifically that, you know, the guys are more prepared. And, you know, the talent level that I faced, you know, Lamar Stevens, Colin Gillespie, Tony Carr, Jaquan Newton, just like these dudes were so good and competitive that it really forced you to be good and and pr- try to work as hard as you can. Cause if you didn't, you would get embarrassed. And if you get embarrassed in Philadelphia, there's video of it. There's everything. So, you you know, that was my mindset. Just try to get to that point. And, you know, fortunately, I had some good breaks that broke my way. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how my high school career ended up. Yeah, man. That's yeah, that's, that's awesome. And then I'm, I'm sorry, I'm moving chronologically here. Obviously, you more. get to Delaware. Um, obviously, you had really tremendous success there as well. I mean, when, when did that sort of click for you there as far as what was the first initial months like? Did you, did you feel like you could, you know, make a make an impact as soon as you got there or did it take a while to sort of you know get get involved in there it's funny so i i committed the last day of high school i was actually washing my hands in my bathroom and i i went i was committed as a walk on to university of hartford um you know penn and brown had pulled their scholarship offers from me they took other commits um so i really didn't have much but i committed to hartford as a one year walk on with a scholarship for the next four or three if i redshirted um yep had the senior year, I had decommitted, you know, as soon as it ended because, you know, I was confident that I was a different player than I was when I was committed in that August before my senior year. Um, yeah. So I committed to Delaware. That was the highest level possible I really thought I would get recruited at. Like if everything worked my way, I thought the CAA was the level. Like whether it was Hofstra, Towson, Delaware, Drexel, something like that, I thought if I played really, really well my senior year, I could be a role guy there. Um, so I ended up committing to Delaware the last day of high school. Um, and then I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't really a senior week kind of guy went down for a few days, came home and got ready and then went to school for summer session one and two. Um, the first day I had there, I, we played open gym and I was like, Oh, this isn't what I expect. I thought these, I, I, this is a little bit, this isn't very much di- different than the Catholic league was. Yeah. And that, you know, goes back to what we were saying, like about the, the level of basketball in the Catholic league. Um, So, you know, I was comfortable. I, I came off the bench. I was probably sixth or seventh man. Um, And then we played LaSalle. I'll never forget this. Our third game. And we had an injury to one of our guys. So I had a bigger role and I had 20. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, you just had 20 as a freshman. If you average three or four points as a freshman and play 15 minutes, that's a successful year. And, yeah. uh, you know, through five games, I was averaging like probably eight, seven or eight. And then my confidence started coming. My coach really believed in me, threw me in the starting lineup um, and right around Christmas time. And now I didn't think I would have – would have had the rookie year. I did, but, um, you know – the coaching staff that I had with the roster situation, I was able to get, kind of get thrown into the fire. I messed up a lot, but I yeah. learned a lot through the experience. And, you know, by the time the end of that year came along, you know, I won rookie of the year and I was all league. Um, I didn't expect that, but I knew that my coaches, they, they know what they're doing. Inglesby, you know, he really knows what he's doing and, you know, he trusted me and 
you know, it paid off individually. And, you know, the next year we got some recruits. Unfortunately, the one tore his meniscus and he was really, really good. Um, but, you know, I, I always – it's funny. Recently I've been thinking just about my playing career because it's been over and I don't miss it. But I do think about, like, how – what a wild ride it was from walking on at Hartford to, you know, playing summer – you know, everything in between. And, you know, yeah. the Delaware years were really something that I treasured because that's when I didn't really have – the name or like I didn't think I was very like I never thought I would have panned out kind of the way it did when I first got there and uh the adjustment was there just being college free time all that you know my grades weren't that great my first semester but um the basketball side was awesome and you know I'm really appreciative of those days yeah you, you think the transfer stuff maybe would have impacted your your trajectory as far as like the NI not the NIL necessarily but more so you know if with injuries, with injuries and stuff that you might have you might have you know played another year that so the funny I don't think I would have gone division one if the transfer portal was there when I was coming out of high school because I say that and I've and I've had conversations with my dad and my brother about this because when you're a fringe guy like you're as close to the division one level as you are the division two level or high academic d3 yeah. whatever you know it's hard to get that offer I mean that's a two hundred fifty thousand dollar investment that a coach is making you know coaches have you know so when you're a coach and you can get a kid who's a really fringe guy, like I wasn't a no brainer. I know that, you know, yeah. especially going into my senior year when that's when most of the offers come, you commit that fall. Um, if you can get a kid who averaged, even if it's three or four points in college basketball, you know what you're kind of getting. And when I transferred, you know, in 19, 2008 or 2017, 2018, you had to redshirt a year. So the amount of, options that these coaches could take were so much more limited now everyone transfers and they play right away so i think i wouldn't have gone division one truthfully um if the transfer portal because if i'm a low major team i'm going to take a kid who has already been in a division one program has some stats some film you know even if they're not a star or you know what you're expecting like you it's safety and secure and i think that would have been the case but uh yeah the whole college basketball landscape is different i think if i when i transferred in 2018, that spring, if the NIL was around, it would have been – now, it wouldn't have influenced my decision, but it would have been interesting to see what these guys are going through right now. You hear these stories on Twitter about this Notre Dame quarter or the Wake Forest kit, and it's just like you can't even comprehend it. Um, and it would have been interesting to go, kind of go through to see what it was really like, you know, not words. Um, but yeah, yeah it's all in all, I think the transfer portal really, you know, really impacted a lot of these kids. And COVID, you know, with the extra COVID year and the transfer portal, like – these friend, there's that's why like if you go to the division two level you look around there's some kids there who don't like they're really 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 good they just slipped through the cracks because they they didn't get seen because of covid and the yeah. others just took immediate eligible transfers yeah and you know what you did when you were playing especially for your, your your final year i feel like you definitely had some buzz going on as far as like popularity and you know there was like some barstool guys interacting with you and yeah stuff and, I was thinking about when they're they're doing that stuff with Jelly Walker um, from UAB or yeah UAB yeah and I'm like I remember like you know those guys tweet at you and stuff I think especially if you know if you guys were made a tournament run yeah um, exactly there, there could be some potential there for something like that and that that's another thing I wanted to bring up is that you know you're a guy who has maybe an untraditional like body and maybe an untraditional type of athletic uh, athletic you're putting it lightly I look like a yeah. mini fridge. Yeah, yeah, you call a uh, what do you call it? What do the guys say? The, the a fire hydrant. Fire hydrant. <laughs> yeah. You hear that stuff? You know, they say when they're watching you play. I mean, you're having these tremendous performances on in really big games, like Villanova games, you know, Florida games, Georgia. I think Georgia game. Um, you know, and, the, and people were saying, you know, this guy looks like a guy you might see at the YMCA, but he can get he can give you thirty buckets. Do you did you ever take any of that personally, or did that kind of just slide off your back, or is it a backhanded compliment, but also sort of like you know what? It's it's just, they're just messing around. It's funny. Uh, I would say most of them were funny. There was one guy who made a comment, uh, that I didn't like, and I, I, you know how I am. I, I so I, <laughs> I hit him up in his DMs, and I was like, "Yo, like you can make all the jokes you want, call me Michelin Man, call me whatever, but like, don't start coming at me too crazy." Uh, <laughs> I forget the guy's name. I think he was like a George Mason beat writer. Um, but for the most part, it was funny because. You know, part of it, like you said, with the buzz or whatever, you know, it, it's unique when you don't see someone traditionally built like a basketball player have basketball success, right? Yeah. Like I'm pasty, I'm six foot four, maybe I can't jump over a phone book. 
Um, so the jokes were funny. I would probably, if there was someone else, I would probably been, you know, if someone else was doing that and looked the way kind of I did out there, uh, I probably would have been joined yeah, and it's in. Also, it's also the way you, the way you score is, as well. You know, you're, you're not a post-up shooter. No, you know, I'm not like a classic. Like, I, I just kind of threw my body at people and was just like <laughs> my strength. Like I could make threes, but like, I wasn't, you know, an elite shooter. And, uh, no, it's funny looking back on it. Cause you know, it's very rare that someone who can't dunk at this height, you know, kind of has a little bit of success in the A-10 and, you know, other leagues. But, you know, it's definitely something that I enjoyed. I, I enjoyed most of the jokes. There's some of them that were really funny, man. I'm not lying. Like, some of them yeah. I would laugh at after the game like that. Who even thinks of this? Twitter is <laughs> you know, Twitter's amazing. Yeah, Twitter is the best. Um, speaking of the A-10, I mean, where do you think sort of that that that, that league ranks? I know this year they don't look um, all too great this year as far as competitiveness and a few good teams, but – Definitely a down year for them. Yeah. They're, you know, traditionally one of the better mid-majors, if not like one of the premier mid-majors in this in this league. Yeah. Um, I think the A-10, they made an interesting choice a few years ago when they scheduled 18 league games instead of 16. And I say that because those two games that you took away from the non-conference schedule, were, those were games you would traditionally play a power five or you'd be in a tournament with – whoever with a chance to get at large resumes. Um, So the A-10 made that choice. And truthfully, it's similar to like, I don't know, the AFC or the NFC South, right? With the Panthers, Buccaneers, whatever. They like right now, they just beat the crap out of each other, you know? (laughs) So like by the time you get to the tournament, like the A-10 for seven straight years had three straight bids. Now they're getting two. This year it'll probably be maybe one, one, maybe yeah. maybe two, unless someone goes, you know, sixteen and two in the league or fifteen and three, and they have some decent non cons. So, yep. Um, it's interesting because I think that the A ten is a great league. The, their basketball schools, right? Dayton, St. Louis, St. Joe's, not, those are basketball schools. Like they, they don't yeah, really. Saint Bonaventure's is up there too. Bonaventure's, yeah, like. There's no real football. Duquesne has football, like, but uh, George Mason doesn't have football. They're, they're basketball schools, right? Uh, yeah. So I think with the extending the league schedule to, so then you know, it's, there's a lot of parity, and by the time um, you end up going to March, you see that there's four or five teams in the NIT, right? Because they just beat the crap out of each other all year. And their metrics aren't great because they're not playing those big non-league games, but they're good teams. Like, they're really good teams. Um, So, do I think the A-10's down? I think the A-10's not as strong in terms of there's no Dayton from the years past when Dayton had Obi Toppin. There's no, you know, even St. Louis, that year they went, you know, their Bonaventures, there's like when they beat UCLA. Like, there's good teams, but I think because of the – the scheduling and, you know, the NIL, because now kids are, you know, there's different factors of where they go to school rather than just playing basketball. Um, you know, it's just a different league, but it's still obviously a great league. It's a great league to watch if you're a fan. Yeah. Right? Like, cause the, the, fans, the, the fans are die hard, like they, they have tradition. So it's definitely a great league that I always, you know, I keep tabs on. Did you ever play in the NIT? I never played in the NIT. No, I, I did not play in the yeah, NIT. Yeah. I was going to ask you because I, I always wondered from that perspective of, you know, you don't you come close to making the tournament. Every, you know, college kid wants to play in the tournament, obviously. And they call it the not invited tournament or whatever. And there's a lot of like jokes about the NIT, but it really is like pretty, I feel like it just, it's not there. You know, if if it's, it just feels like, I don't know, it's not demoralizing, but. you know, No. Yeah. I think for those, you know, I was never in a position where I was on the bubble, but for those guys who are like that first team and they, they, you know, they write it like on the board, like when they do the selection show, like first four teams out, they put them right there. And (laughs) if I'm one of those kids, I'm like, dang, (laughs) like I was this close, but you know, the NIT is still great because if you, the thing about the NIT, the important part is you have to keep your focus, right? Cause you, you're so let down all of not making the NCAA tournament that, you know, I would assume that if you keep your focus, because, you know, Penn State won it when we were in college. You know, they had a great run through it. Tony Carr and them, Lamar. Um, that was the COVID yeah. year, right? Which they? That was the COVID year when they didn't make the tournament that year, right? Or that was uh, year. Was the... It, it might have been the year before. Yeah, well, they were, yeah, they were good um, that year, too. It was around – but you you play in the you play in Madison Square Garden for the semis in the national championship or the NIT. So, you know, it's a great, great tournament. It, but I would imagine there's some frustration if you're right on that bubble. Yeah. Did you did you get you know especially you specifically as a local guy, you know being in the tradition so long? Did you get a special certain type of you know incitement or 
not necessarily excitement, a different level of excitement, but just for those big five games, just, you know, did you get a little bit more pumped up for those or? Absolutely. I, I think big Especially five. Because I know you have some certain thoughts about Villanova. You're because you're a St. Joe's guy through and yeah, through. Yeah. You know, all, you know, I, if Villanova's not playing, a, you know, there's a few teams that I'll root for over Villanova just because, you know, if I know the coach or if I yeah. know players, but you know, the big five games, the energy there is insane, you know, whether that's at Temple or it's at LaSalle and there's everyone in the city who, who has a microphone or has a, you know, a, a, a camera or anything yeah. like that. They, they're there. And it, like I said, in Philadelphia, everything you do is magnified because it's basketball city. And if you perform, they'll know. And if you don't perform, they'll also know. So, you know, I always liked getting up for those games. I liked, Penn, you know, playing Penn at the Palestra, you know, Temple, just like the history between Temple and St. Joe's when they were in the A-10, they were like the two top top three teams in that league for a large part of the early 2000s. So the tradition is there. And, you know, I hope that the big five in the city starts really rejuvenating it because the city itself is a basketball city that we've talked about. And, you know, I think it would do wonders if, you know, those double headers were sold out like they used to be when we were growing up with the streamers and the uh, yeah. the rollouts and all that. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I mean, I think they're trying to do some stuff now. I saw they are. They're, they're branding it a little more. And I know I've seen some emails or some tweets about tickets and, you know, all that. But, you know, I definitely think uh, I definitely think that that's a smart approach to try to really build toward. Now, it's a new you got to think about when we grew up, Dumphy, Phil, Jay, Dr. G. Donahue has been there for a while, but it was Dumphy before that at Penn. So. And we, I mean, I know St. Joe's has a new D. I know Temple has a new AD. I'm not really sure about Penn and Nova, but there, it's a new, it's a transition, you know? So the old tradition of the big five, it's still there. It's still special, but it's not the people who really were pushing it forward and Cheney and Phil yeah. and all those names. So mm -hmm. I think they're doing a good job. I know St. Joe's is, is a big supporter of the big five and, you know, coach Lang will play any game anywhere, you know, with that big five. So um, I'm hoping to see it keep uh, bouncing back. And what was the players' mentality? You just mentioned that about the, the you know, the lying. I'll play anybody, anytime, anywhere. What was the players' mentality about going into those games against, you know, some some a, a little bit level, higher level of competition than what you might usually play, or like scheduling games that might be a little more favorable for your team? Um, you know, instead of doing the opposite. What, what was the team sort of morale about that? You know, I think I assume you guys are all competitive guys. You want to go against the best, and you and you don't care what really happens there. You're just gonna. You, you want to play against the best, right? Or... Yeah. Yeah. No, you always, it was funny. I was on a St. Joe's podcast like a month ago and they asked that question, you know, how did you feel about those games? And, you know, I always wanted to go against the best. Now I can't speak for my teammates. I would assume that they also wanted to go against the best, but I always did because in my mind, if you don't, if you don't push yourself and you have a, nine, a like a, let's say a, your non-conference schedule, you buy four games, they come play, you're in a, okay tournament with no real at-large bids you know you're not preparing yourself for the adversity and what you're going to face on a road game at Davidson right or you're not going to or when you go to Bonaventure it's freezing cold there's no anything in the town and there's rabid fan like yeah. those environments push you now the one year was COVID the COVID year so we went Auburn Kansas Drexel they made the tournament Nova Tennessee I ripped my thumb against Tennessee so yeah. we went against five teams that made the tournament Four at large bids. That was a lot, but yeah, that was crazy. Was, it was hard to get games because teams were just canceling left and right. Like, and yeah. the, but like another thing is Coach Lang's first year, like Bradley went to the tournament, we beat them. Old Dominion was decent that year. We went at UConn, we won. And then Taylor gets hurt during the Florida game and we're battling Florida. And then that the season didn't go as planned. So I'm a big fan of pushing yourself, you know, at any level. I, I don't think you really know who you are if you're just kind of playing teams that you know you, you're comfortable with i think to get comfortable in the big moments you got to be a little uncomfortable to get there um so i, I love it you know I, I think as a competitor you know how competitive i am um and yeah you know for guys to share similar sentiment i would hope yeah definitely i mean if you're at that level and you're not you don't have that mindset you know you're in the wrong spot you're in the wrong, um, exactly that's a great way to look at it what do you so obviously you know you had you had you, you had sort of both coaches there um not, not to get into specifics of like your preference or anything like that but did you did these guys have two different styles? We're talking about Lang and Martelli. Did they have sort of different coaching styles, different you know sort of mentalities about the way that they want to see their program move? And you know, you're as as a young coach now, are you taking both you know some advice from both of those guys? Oh, I, I was blessed. You know, I played for three great coaches in college. You know, I had 
Martin Inglesby, who they went to the tournament last year. I had Phil, who's a legend, and then I had Coach Billy, who, you know, he he's very, very gifted offensively, his mind, right? His baseline out of bounds. If you go look at synergy the last four years, you know, that's really where you judge a, a coach in the, the quick moments like that. And he was great. Um, they all had different personalities. You know, Coach Martin was like this. Phil, you know, you wouldn't – Phil was just Phil, and, you know, he's like a uncle, father figure to me. Like, I, I can't – like, he's the most trustworthy person. He would always try to – put me in the best situations, like off and on the court, get me to meet people that, you know, I wouldn't have met or opened my yeah. eyes. Coach Lang, honestly, like he, the, he is such a good human that like he made me want to be a better human. And when I messed up, cause I did, um, he always had my back and used it as a learning experience. Whereas I think other people who I haven't had would reprimand me or, you know, make me feel awful about myself. He was so patient and understanding and, you know, he's a he's a really good guy, and we have a good relationship to this day. You know, it's not the relationship I have with Phil because I've known Phil since I was twenty, since I was two years old. Yeah. So it'll never be like that. But it'll never be like that with anyone besides Phil. So you know, Coach Lang was a blessing to have in terms of just seeing the bigger picture. And you know, he he honestly thought I was a better basketball player than I thought I was. Like when he first got there, he was like, "I think you have a chance to be really, really good, and I think you could be a point guard." And I laughed in his face. Because I just didn't think, like, you know, I redshirted. I was at Delaware, like, my whole year. Like, Jared left, Fresh left. Like, it was just a transition. And I didn't lose confidence, but I was like, oh, this is not what I thought it would be. Um, and, he, you know, he always kept me upbeat. So, all three of them have really helped me and shaped me in kind of the way I think, you know, basketball should look, essentially, right? How you treat people and what you do. Yeah, I mean, so much of the Martelli stuff that, you know, he's renowned for, like, is the off-the-court stuff, the coaches versus cancer stuff. Yep. And He's specifically a guy people look to as, like, you know, a great figure. Yeah, um, I was talking to him last night about that. I said, what do you miss the most? And he said, he said, I just miss going to a high school game in Philadelphia or I miss going to pick up a coaches versus cancer check. You know, I just miss that part of it because that's the part that he loved, right? You can love every everything you do. You want to love something a little bit more than the other, and that was his thing, you know, to give back and to introduce his players to new opportunities and, you know, the coach versus cancer breakfast and you know the the numerous amount of public speakings he did just to get people to think on a you know a different type of level he's a, he's an interesting cat um so you know he misses that part for sure and you know he, he was great at what he did he was a great great leader for the for our proud university yeah um i, I gotta talk about sort of the shot that i uh i threw it out on twitter as a little teaser uh, talk me through that shot and you know obviously it was so quick but maybe if you even had a second to think about that. Um, and also obviously every young man's dream, every kid's dream to get on sports center. Yeah. And like, what a, what a cool thing that was. So talk about the, the actual moment itself, maybe after the shot and then get into like sort of that, the, the, the buzz that came after that. So it's funny. So during the game, you know, I had a decent game that game. I, I hit a, I hit a lot of three. It was yeah. one of the games where I made was actually shooting the ball well from three. Um, so I, we were down like eight with like four minutes left and we came back and it was great. And that play started because I missed a box out in a three point game. The kid missed a free throw, like an 85% three free throw shooter missed a free throw. <laughs> so when the ball rolled off and the kid tipped it and went to the corner, they got it. I was like, Oh my God, we're going to lose because I just gave a rebound. We didn't even give us a chance and it was my fault. <laughs> Anyways, the ball came down and they threw it. And I was running down the court and I didn't realize Lorenzo was next to me. Maybe I'm just like a selfish teammate, but <laughs> I grabbed it and I always liked football more than basketball growing up. And I was, I was decent at it. And I thought I was behind the line. That was like the crazy part. They ruled it too, but I was sure that I was behind the line. Like I thought the guy, was, the guy tripped you. He was like, he was like, that is a stupid play. Yeah, <laughs> and like you got to get behind the line. And like in my head, and it's funny if you watch the bench reactions. Coach Lang thought it was over. He shook hands. Coach yeah. Griffin, John Griffin, he starts pointing at my feet. He's like, he was behind the line. He's behind the line. And I was like, I think I was. So we go to overtime. Whatever. I, Coach comes back. We we ended up losing the game, but during the free throw line, Kellen Grady, he's, he's like, "Yo, you're gonna, you're gonna be on top ten. And I was like, "What do you mean top ten? Like, I didn't think it was that crazy. Like, because I was just maybe locked in the game, and I was like, "Ah, oh, like funny blah." And he's like, "No, seriously, that was wild." And then I left, and we flew home, 
And I went to PJ Wellahan, shout out PJ Wellahan. I went to, with a few of my buddies just to grab wings after the game. Like we were literally just chilling. Like we were off the next day. I wanted to see my buddies. We just got wings and then we went back to uh, my friend's house and we were just hanging out watching sports and yeah. midnight rolls around. And I wasn't thinking that way, but ESPN's on and no. 10 through two come and we're like, all right, well, if it's going to be here and <laughs> I think it was Van Pelt or someone said it, and I was like, "Like, look at Are this." You saw show. it live before seeing it on Twitter or anything. I saw it on Twitter, but I didn't see it. Like, it I didn't cool. know. Like, I didn't. Like, so I think CBS Sports or someone tweeted it was like, "Holy God, what a shot by Ryan!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents were at Charles Barkley's house in Arizona, so they weren't even like <laughs> in town, so we could go. And they had turned it off because they thought it was over. And then my mom, I guess. Uh, I Charles told me like he texted me after whatever that was whatever just a crazy shot but yeah. he's like your mom is insane and I was like I can't imagine but apparently my mom freaked out it was I didn't expect it to go top 10 you know obviously it stinks we lost the game but the shot itself I still look and I it's a lot of people good. thought I caught it with one hand I caught it with two I just removed it and pushed it just because I was worried about time but yeah that was that was a shot that I wouldn't be able to do over again if I tried. You know, like I wouldn't be able to get the rhythm of that, the catch, all of it. Uh, no, it, it was a cool memory. Number one play on top ten when you can't dunk or do anything that cool is is you know it's pretty it's pretty yeah, great. It's, it's sweet. Uh, what, what would you say, sort of, like the, your experiences at you know St. Joe's? We're, we're you know we're gonna go talk to people from a lot of different schools of the Big Five or five schools of the Big Five. Um, you're the St. Joe's guy. I think we have a special Temple guest coming up next. Uh, like what would you say sort of is the vibe around St. Joe's? You know, what was sort of your experience there? And, you know, a small school with, you know, passionate fans we talked about, but just more of like that outside of the court kind of stuff. I think that St. Joe's is the best place in the world, and I genuinely believe that. I left Delaware, a good basketball situation, a, a party school. People thought it was a really fun school. I, I, you know, I, I don't really know because, I you know, basketball. Yeah. But when I left and I went to St. Joe's, I was – I've never been – I actually texted my mom today, and I was like – I'm, like, thinking – because my sister's graduating. She's the last one at college, and she's graduating from St. Joe's in the spring. Like, I, I think that school, because of the profile of kids and where they're from and, like, the proximity that everyone kind of knew each other a little bit growing up or, like, through – they got buddies who have buddies, you know. They use the – Yeah, so, you know, like – I know who you were in middle school. You knew who I was in middle school. We weren't friends, right? Or And, like, there's other situations like that with plenty of kids that we're friends with that – and then when you're there, there's no division. Like, there's, like, just one big group, essentially. Now, there's different yeah. friend groups in the group, but there's a lot of people who are similar people, similar interests, and they're down to earth. And, you know, I, I loved my time at St. Joe's. I think St. Joe's is a special, special place with people that – really care about the institution and i think that's the uh the coolest part about the the pride that st joe's has you don't really find that in in universities as much as you do on hawk hill definitely man all right dale thanks for coming on brother i really appreciate it get back to uh getting the hit in the books and hope you have a great season over at uh albany and we'll be rooting for you with the squad over there the uh Uh, man great to see you great to talk to you i uh i look forward to seeing you again soon my boy all right man take care all right later